Hi, everyone. It's so nice to have you here. Um, I, I'm really excited to hear and learn what you have. Um, so part of the reason why we're using this Padlet to sort of uh, grease the path of this interactive session is I know I'm the sort of person who really benefits from having some time to think through my thoughts, maybe type through my thoughts before I get started with um, participating in a conversation, but uh, I think that our um, conference conveners can help bring some people to the table. If you're really interested in starting and joining the conversation, go ahead and use that raise your hand. Um, or if you're someone who just likes to freewheel and chat and just wants to tell us some of the new um, services that you employed at your library, um, rather than filling it out in the, in the Padlet to start out with, that would be wonderful. Um, Melanie and Charlie, is there anyone who is able to come to the table uh, now or who is raising their hand to join the table and start maybe sharing their ideas? Not yet, Caitlin. Um, we'll, we'll, if, when someone raises their hand and they're ready, we'll put them straight up to the table so you don't need to worry about monitoring that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so let's see some of the ideas that we have in here. So we have oh, some, some really great ideas. So what I think, one of the things that I think is really interesting about the COVID pandemic uh, scenario is it really forced us to think about how we can either bring in new ideas, new tools, new technologies, um, or transform processes and technologies that we've been using so far. Um, and so I'm, I'm very excited to hear some of the new ideas uh, that, you've, that you have to share. Hello, Anna, thank you for joining us at the table. And Tsinghua Xu, welcome to the table. Hello. Tsinghua, would you like to share um, one of the services or um, uh, change, new services or a change in services that you're interested in sharing with us? Sure. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you just fine. Thank you. Okay, um, so hello everyone. My name is Tsinghua Xu. I'm the Head of Access Services at NYU Shanghai. Um, our team is responsible for providing services such as circulation, interlibrary loan, course reserves, and we also oversee the stacks in library space. So in response to COVID-19, we, you know, we all know we need to make adjustment to our old workflows or come up with creative ideas to adapt to the unexpected situation, just like any other libraries did. So there are two initiatives that I think probably worth sharing with all of you. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Zenwei Shanghai, it is a China's uh, first Sino-US research university and third degree granting campus of the NYU uh, Global Network located in Shanghai, China. So um, in response to a global public health crisis, uh, triggered by the pandemic. NYU Shanghai followed the public health guidance and delayed opening of the campus for spring 2020 a semester and moved to online teaching instead. But for access service, how to make sure our patrons could continue to access the collections remotely became a challenge for us. So our first response was to check whether book already available in licensed electronic format. If not, then to further check if there was a license e version for purchase. However, as we all know, not all the books are available in e format. So we have to uh, had to devise a solution to this problem. Control digital lending seems to be the um, only viable option under that special circumstance. Um, control digital lending or CDL is a emerging concept that enables the library to, to digitize a physical item from their collections and loan access restrict file to one use at a time. And also for a limited time based on the own to rate loan ratio in the library collection. So in other words, if a library only has one physical copy of a specific title, you can only loan uh, one copy of the digital file to one use at any given time. 
And the bigger challenge that we were facing at the time was to figure out a technical solution to ensure that the digital file cannot be copied or distributed. Um, by collaborating with our campus IT, we managed to develop a workflow in a very short time using a Google spreadsheet and Google Apps script to allow Access Service staff to loan a CDL version um, to our patrons in a controlled manner. And moreover, the script automatically removes the user from the sharing list and allow us to land the digital file at the four hour intervals, which is the um, loan period for our course reserve collection. So that's the story about our CDL project. And the other thing that I'm sorry, it will take a bit of a while, but the other thing is about how we manage our space during pandemic. I'm not sure if everyone has uh, heard of WeChat. It's the most popular Chinese social media app that allows people to send text messages, for example, um, place video and audio calls and post image text and short video taken to share with family and friends. And they can also you know, interact, interact with each other. We can also use WeChat to make mobile payments. Um, there are a lot more features that, than I just uh, mentioned. So for our university, we, has, we have an enterprise account where the uh, university community members can you know, receive updates from various departments on campus, um, check shuttle bus schedules, for example, or report facility problems, or we can use utilize functions like um, open a lockers that contain packages from a delivery guy, or topping up our campus card, etc. So prior to the pandemic, uh, our library implement a tool called Save My Spot under the enterprise account. It is a seat management tool, or you can call it anti-camping tool, that uh, allows our user or student to scan a QR code at the corner of the library table and keep the seat for 30 minutes if they need to step away for a very short break, you know, coffee break or bathroom run, etc. The second feature of the tool is users are encouraged to use Save My Spot to take a photo of unattended items on the table in the library and upload the photo to the back end of the system for record keeping. And then they can remove the unattended items and take the seat. So as our university reopened at the end of April 2020, after three months of closure, uh, the EXA team rearranged furniture in the library, reduced seat for um, you know, keeping social distance. We also repurposed Save My Spot, um, of course, with help from IT department for contact tracing purpose. Um, we require our users to check in and check out when they sit down to study and, you know, and before they leave the library. So this is a precaution uh, measure that we took at a time and we didn't really have because everything was you know uh, turned out to be very um, safe and nothing really happened um, I think these are the two things that um, I want to share with everyone um, I think that's that's all I want to share thank you that's great that's thank you for sharing um, all of that Tsinghua um, as you were speaking I was looking at the padlet here on my phone and I actually saw a few other people posted or or liked um, uh, other people's posts on, on similar topics. So I see um, someone posted about providing access to digitized materials through Hati Trust. Um, and I also see someone mentioned uh, this idea of on-demand digitization for rare and archival materials, um, as well as distance borrowing and scanning. Uh, does anyone either, if, if that was you who posted that into the Padlet or if, if your library did something similar, does anyone want to um, raise your hand and join the table and share what your experience was um, using some of these digitization tools? I'm, I'm curious to hear how, um, how your, your students or the faculty or your users responded to these digitization tools? Did they, did they like them? Did they not like them? Did they have difficulties accessing them? Um, do they have thoughts on it if these, these services are ending? Um, I'd love to hear that. Hello, Jacqueline, welcome to the table. 
Thank you. Um, I will use the right camera in just a minute. Um, <laughs> hello, I'm the one who posted on-demand digitization. Um, I work with the rare and special collections at McGill University in Montreal. Um, and they, we had the ability to go back on site, our staff, um, about the end, the month of August last summer. And um, that's when we were able to launch the on-demand digitization. And we also provided access through HashiTrust. Um, so our service basically checked if there was already access to HashiTrust, we provided that link. And if there wasn't, that was when we turned to on-demand digitization. And our lab being was sorely understaffed, of course, um, due to the pandemic and the limitations of the number of people who could be on site. So I don't know, like so many institutions, we our lab does rely on student staffing and we train a whole cohort of students who keep that lab running throughout the year. And we didn't have those students due to COVID. So we actually had other members of the library staff across different departments who were then trained and started putting in hours in digitization to keep that demand service running. And we've completed a lot. In terms of response and uptake, um, I'm not sure. I'd have to double check our spreadsheets, which are lengthy, and the records from our digitization lab. But the service has provided access and continued to allow researchers to do work um, before we were able to have any on-site consultations at all. So it kept things running, essentially. And now, having relied basically solely on that for our prioritization over the last while, um, we now, looking forward, have to decide what to do um, and how to reprioritize our digitization digitization queue going forward and if we'll continue to offer this on-demand service because there's always complications with digitization requests. You have to have it cataloged if it's not and sometimes it's not. Um, and also you have to, there's sometimes copyright questions that you have to clear, of course, depending on how old your material is. So for us, the service was invaluable also to continue our work of resourcing and um, professors helping researchers and teaching from our collections ourselves. So digitization also enabled our staff to work remotely because we could only have some in on a rotating basis. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the major ways that we provided service because our collections, like so many, are rare and unique in the world. So if you can't digitize them, they're just it's a complete roadblock. So that was our, our workaround and we'll see how it goes going forward. So I imagine that this digitization project was on a, on a much larger scale than what perhaps what you had been digitizing before the pandemic, but you had had um, some, some digitization initiative. In, in fact, I'd say probably we the on-demand digitization was actually less than what we would be doing on a regular basis. Um, okay. We have a very active and excellent standard of digitization and the lab runs really, really well. But what would be running through it on a regular basis was more systematic. So we'd be moving through collections or grant funded projects or things that were prioritized for teaching and research projects. Um, so there would be a different way of going about it. And this system changed so that it was really based solely on what people requested and really couldn't be found anywhere else. So in some ways it gave us if we looked at the results and what we digitized over the last year, it really shows you a very concrete list of what is unique and actively used in our collections. It's an interesting data set from that point of view. Yeah, that's that's absolutely fascinating. Um, I think I think it's very cool how. Sorry, I have cats and they are running around in the background, and they're being very loud. Um, the the fun of doing conferences in the Zoom era. Um, I think I think it's very interesting how um, the the requests for some of these digitization um, projects, as well as um, access to materials like in Hathi Trust, um, can be really insightful, even from a collection development standpoint. Um, do you find that there are parallels between some of these digitization requests and and other aspects of reference services or instruction services that you had needed to provide um, to your campus? That's a question I'd have to send out to my colleagues, yeah. unfortunately. I can't speak to it. Um, uh, the only thing I can speak to is really that things are looking up. And once we reach the critical vaccination quota in Montreal, which they're predicting is sometime in September, the, we'll kind of flip that switch and 
once we're back to normal operations, we will no longer be providing HathiTrust access. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the interesting correlations, we'd have to refer that over to Catherine Hands and user yeah. services and, and, and the others. So unfortunately, I can't really say much to that. That's all right. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's that's a really interesting and a great opportunity to share some uh, some more of the projects that you've been been working on. Um, Michelle, thank you for joining us at the table. Uh, would you like to share any of the services that um, instruction or reference or collections and access? Sure. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I apologize if there's an echo. I just moved out of my apartment and. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if you can hear the echo. Um, so I can't speak too much to our access services. I know that we did start um, a locker um, service once we were back in the building um, because we had limited um, service points uh, with student interaction. So the lockers actually have proved super popular and we might continue doing that. Um, and uh, just like Jacqueline, we're, um, we were, we used Hathi Trust. We got that up and running, and now we're probably going to end that as well. So I'm a little sad about that because I thought it was kind of a really great, um, you know, service to kind of add. Um, but I guess to also kind of maybe move the um, direction of things um, into instruction a little bit. Just spreading around. Um, <laughs> so I'm the head of instruction um, at NYU's main campus in uh, Manhattan. And um, when we got started, um, everybody kind of thought, oh, this will be a couple of weeks. And then <laughs> it turned out to be much, much longer. Um, so we reached out to our colleagues um, in Shanghai and um, kind of got some information on how they did their transition earlier than we did. Um, and then we kind of also built um, a network uh, between all of our campuses because we realized that a lot of us were doing similar things and it was really helpful to kind of communicate. Um, and I think that kind of helped open up some communication um, channels that maybe we probably should continue um, going forward and trying to figure out what that might look like and making sure that we have a way to kind of share information on a regular basis, even if it's not every couple of weeks, uh, maybe once a month or once every couple months, um, just to kind of be informed with what everyone's doing because each of us has different opportunities to kind of explore different tools. Um, during the pandemic, um, we were in the middle of a search for an online librarian and then it got paused. Um, then it got restarted and uh, it was one of just a couple um, positions to be approved. Um, and partly that was because people saw the importance of online education in a new way that we didn't really have to send in like piles and piles of paperwork and assessments to kind of show how important it was. Um, so now we have our online librarian um, who is working with one of our other librarians um, who secretly had an instructional design master's <laughs> degree that we had no idea about. So the two of them have been creating all kinds of really great um, learning objects and exploring different um, instruction tools. So some of the things we're really looking at um, getting into is our new or our new learning management system. Um, we moved from Sakai over to Brightspace and uh, the functionality of Brightspace is phenomenal. And it allows us to have all these different portals into our instructors' classes um, or to build modules and to build classes that that then instructor, instructors can embed into their classes. So we're really looking into that and how we can expand on um, the LMS and really create kind of a whole kind of compartmentalized learning experience um, through our LMS. And we are already having a few instructors who are interested in kind of creating entire um, Kind of entire learning programs around it so we're kind of learning it at the same time that we're trying to build it knowing that uh, there'll be some growing pains and that it's an iterative process that you know we're going to keep fixing things and updating things and adding um, as we kind of go along so i'd say that's probably one of the bigger things that's going to come out of um out of the pandemic yeah it sounds like um 
I, I'm hearing sort of uh, this, this pleasant uh, direction that there was opportunity, uh, unexpected opportunities to come out of this uh, genuinely awful experience that we all had to go through. Um, yeah. And I noticed in the Padlet, um, a couple of other encouraging posts. Um, I see one post of one person mentioned uh, more in-class instruction. Um, instructors ask, asked for more librarian presentations in classes, which we welcomed this increase in invitations. And I also saw someone posted um, that they were able to set up their own Moodle site. So they write, uh, we struggled to be granted our own virtual learning site as we're not an academic teaching department, but we do a huge amount of teaching. So this was an excellent development. We can direct tutors to this site now instead of running extra live sessions when we're overworked. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if these came from the same person or if they're from two people. Um, if you would be interested in telling us a little bit more or if you'd be comfortable telling us a little bit more about that, um, please do raise your hand, um, especially, uh, so I see five people gave hearts to uh, getting to set up your own Moodle site. And if you are willing to share, I would love to hear a little bit more about um, how you direct tutors to this site and how you and how you use this site um, in your instructor in, in your instruction. And Caitlin, this is Susan, your co-presenter, and I'll say there's also a really interesting post under collections and access of uh, some enterprising librarian, I love this, used GoPro, you know, that he headset camera to do a virtual session, uh, sharing documents with the teaching group. So Wow, I can imagine someone walking up and down the stacks with this and pulling me in so much more dynamic. What a great idea. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I'm going to use that one. Yeah, yeah, that's it's very fun. You almost get to think like a, a little bit of a videographer in your development of your instruction tools. Did anyone else? Um, sorry, I, I don't know if the person who was able to um, who, who mentioned setting up their own Moodle sites um, or the person who posted about being able to do more in-class instruction. Would you be interested or willing to share a little bit more about what that was? So I found myself, I also found um, uh, an increase in my instruction during, during the pandemic. Um, both, both for virtual instruction, and then once we went back to um, once we went back to having in-person live classes, having more of that. Um, Michelle, I, I, you mentioned being uh, heavily involved in instruction in your role. Did you find that there was an increase in the um, number of workshops that you were asked to teach there? Yeah, we definitely had an increase in workshops. Um, since we were mostly virtual, um, even through, I would say last spring and even the summer, we're not really, we're not doing anything in person. We've only had uh, one instructor request an in-person class in the past year. So, um, mm -hmm. so a lot of our work, um, but again, we're in New York city and, you know, things got a little dicey here, maybe in ways mm -hmm. that didn't happen elsewhere. Um, so I think people are being really cautious, but our workshops, definitely, we saw a huge increase in um, attendance to those. And honestly, I, I think I would rather do um, online workshops rather than in person, because it seems like we just had so many more people able to drop in. And it also helped um, for our students who were studying abroad um, or on other campuses who were interested to be able to attend. Um, whereas before we could only limit it to whoever was available at that specific exact time. And then recording them also gave um, people an opportunity who couldn't attend but were interested to, to be able to watch it later. So I think that's something we're going to carry forward as well, um, just because there was so much um, interest in those workshops. Mm -hmm. How did you scale that, that increased uh, what what did you what did you do to balance that that demand on your time? Um, so for us, um, really, a lot of it was kind of figuring out things that we were already doing workshops in, and then kind of transferring that into kind of the remote uh, Zoom world. Um, for others, we had a couple of adjuncts that we hired, um, and so we farmed out some of the workshops to them. Um, they only did a couple of them. Uh, 
some of them did a couple more than others, but like, I think there was one who only did literally one. Um, so we, we tried to spread it around a little bit. Um, we invited some of our colleagues to um, consider doing a workshop and we kind of expanded it out um, so that it wasn't just our department and it wasn't just like a small group of people doing them um, and really kind of broadened that out. And my boss was really kind of instrumental in, in working on that and making sure that that, that got done and she connected with a lot of people and she held a bunch of trainings and you know kind of exploratory sessions so that people who were kind of interested um, could could attend and see if it's something that they wanted to do um, and we also did some trainings um, on using zoom and um, kind of like how to do zoom as a workshop versus an instructional session um, how to manage questions. Um, sometimes we had additional um, colleagues working to kind of help with chat or to help with the slides. Um, and we also shared out our slides in case there were things that people could kind of repurpose. Um, so we tried to make it as easy as possible for people to be able to kind of step into that. Um, and I think once our colleagues did and they saw that they could kind of reuse that content, um, I think they were kind of excited. <laughs> Because <laughs> several of them did, you know, repeat sessions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I I see some other really really interesting um, items that are shared. Oh, I'm sorry, I see a question in here. Um, oh, sorry, it was Susan's question. I was noticing the chats. Um, so I see a few other really interesting posts here in the Padlet, which I'll, I'll read out just in case people are kind of only on their, uh, able to view things on their computer. Um, so I see someone mentioning uh, some expanded collaboration, the fact that their librarian team joined a team of access and instructional services across campuses to share information and, and to exchange ideas. Um, and I, I think this one also really stands out to me as a, as a really interesting idea. Uh, many more study skills webinars and the thing that stands out to me is so interesting here. Um, and again, if this is yours, please raise your hand. I'd love to hear more about what this looked like on your campus. Um, this person shared uh, that they included regular virtual hangouts with subject specific liaison librarians. Um, did anyone else who's uh, attending uh, get to have some sort of a um, virtual hangout with librarians or virtual office hours with librarians? Did anyone, wh whether you're here at the, the virtual table now or if you're uh, attending, you, you can either raise your hand in chat or you could just mention it in the text chat. Um, did anyone else use that sort of virtual office hours? Hi, Caitlin, this is Susan again. If other ones want to speak, I'll um, stop talking, but uh, I'll tell you we have. Uh, it, we expanded our hours for live chat, uh, responding to incoming emails with questions. We also expanded our virtual um, appointments and we do those via WebEx uh, for reference services questions um, and uh, you know, in-depth searches that students needed to do for papers or projects. We also uh, have doctoral students, so they've got long research projects over years uh, that need to happen. And so we expanded that. So chat and we also did for the first time a uh, texting so we uh, set up a text number to um, talk that way and we had to tell a couple of people that we have we can't do long reference interviews via text but we can say uh, this these are how this is how you can best get in touch with us to do long reference mm -hmm. interviews but texting was new yeah yeah, and I, I see someone else has mentioned here um, on the Padlet that they actually found that some of their one-on-one -on -one or the one-to-one -one student appointments became much longer because students did want to talk about their learning experiences as well as their library um, and information literacy-based questions. Um, it, it, it seems to me, you know, looking at this Padlet and looking at some of the, the things that people are sharing in terms of especially instruction and, um, and the reference services, that what we're really seeing is, is, is almost under this, this incredible pressure uh, of, of the pandemic that people, people were really showing an appetite uh, for library services and, and for our instruction and for the research services. Uh, I, th I think a lot of what people have been sharing so far have been about um, their services in the academic 
uh, environment working in universities and higher education. But I know that many of the people who are attending today's conference, uh, or rather the conference this week, also represent um, uh, museums, galleries, um, and other special collections and archives. So um, I would be very interested to hear um, if, if you want to share, if, if you feel that you know we're getting too much into the academic world of things, um, and you want to share how some of these services were unique at your institution um, as, as maybe not a university kind of institution, it would be wonderful to, to hear what your experience was, because I imagine that things were different between, between our different campuses. Um, you know, as we're talking about this idea of going to nor going back to normal, or there is no going back to normal, as, as the case may be, um, I think a lot of our libraries uh, have to start thinking about what to do and how to how to either continue these these services, how to modify these services, or how to um, discontinue the services in the future. Um, and the potential complaints that might come in from, from users who have become accustomed to some of these services, um, like the readiness for on-demand digitization and thinking about how we might be scaling those digitization services um, or the availability of things like the HathiTrust ETAS service, um, which I know our institution really relied upon heavily. Um, has, has any, any of uh, the attendees in today's session, um, again, please feel free to raise your hand or to type in the chat. Um, have, have you started thinking about uh, or, or dealing with what patrons will respond to with the loss of certain services like the ETAS, uh, the HathiTrust ETAS? And I'll just break in a moment to say that uh, the link to the Padlet so that you can uh, open and add your comments to the Padlet uh, is in the chat. So go ahead and find that link in the chat. Also, if you'd like to speak verbally, please raise your hand and the administrators will bring you to the table. I'll also mention too that um, uh, we have, I work at a health sciences the university and we had many uh, new collections being offered to us because uh, it was all the COVID science was um, being developed and put out there as fast as possible. So we immediately added those to our um, collections, uh, also created a new LibGuide uh, collecting all those new uh, offerings and found many given by vendors that were free and continuously um, reviewed, vetted, and added those. And that was really important for people doing as much immediate research as, as the situation demanded. And I found that heartening in um, a great way that the vendors would literally open their uh, banks of resources and materials so that we could all address what was needed to be found in how to how to move forward in this new world in this pandemic and get solutions. Hmm. I see another very interesting um, comment that was shared in our Padlet. Uh, so this idea of uh, virtual viewing of archive items. Um, so this person has shared, it's, it's so, sort of along the lines of what we were talking about with the, the on-demand digitization of archival and rare materials. Uh, but this, this person has shared that they're trialing virtual viewing of archives items remotely. So they're using a camera that's linked with a computer and Zoom calls with users. Uh, and the benefit is that this reduces unnecessary travel and users can preview items to decide if a high-res digital copy is needed, um, which actually gets around the issue of uh, unnecessarily and unnecessary and time-consuming digitization. Um, the person who, who posted this, uh, do you mind if I ask, um, is, is this something that you think that your library would continue to do after, um, after your library resumes its normal operations, is this, uh, and please either feel free to type in the chat or raise your hand to let us, um, to be added to the table. Um, is this a service that you think that your library would continue offering or is this a COVID era only service? It's a great innovation, I think. It's um, it one that seems uh, that should be carried on uh, because especially at the time in digitization, 
is consuming not only in uh, time, man hours, but uh, the cost uh, and uh, uh, what do you call it? Degradation of the machines that do this. Mm -hmm. And oh, someone yeah, is uh, asking you to repeat your question, please, Caitlin. Yes. So what I'm what I'm curious is um, so this idea of the virtual viewing of archive items is this something that your library was doing? Uh, so I, I see that it's a trial. I'm I'm curious. Is this something that you would continue doing um, with your library after you resume your post pandemic? normal operations or is this something that you would really be only be doing during this this COVID era and if there's I, no return to normal what is the new normal for you yeah so so Abigail thank you for sharing that you're going that you you think to continue I, I think it's a great idea I think I think it's absolutely inspired it's I mean it's not too far away is it this idea of virtual virtual viewings of, of an item. It's not that far off from advice that we may have already given to our patrons. I know I have, you know, if you're not sure if you want a, a book or if you're not sure if you need the whole book, request an interlibrary loan scan of the table of contents or the index first and let that help guide you in making that decision. Um, and I think, I think it's just, it's a great idea <laughs> to, to share this virtual viewing of, um, of these archival materials before you get into that lengthy digitization process, because you're right, it does, it does take a really long time to, to make those scans. Hi, Gil, welcome to the table. Gil, are you, are you the person who had that really cool idea of using the GoPro in, in the stacks for your instruction? Hi, folks. Yes. Can you hear me? I yes. can, and I'm Fabulous. dying to hear more. <laughs> well, um, we have a group of outdoor learning students who mm -hmm. um, aren't always on campus at the same time. We also have a lot of community users because it's a really small archive in a remote place and people from the community who just like to visit to see the archive stuff. The point with the camera and the GoPro particularly is that I could wander to other archive material. I, I, I always get a, a batch of stuff for the students anyway, or visitors. And so there's, a, there's always kinds of things that you think they might like to see. But mm -hmm. as we could discuss it virtually, I was free then to go back to the stacks and pick something else out. And they could follow my day, which yeah. people can't yeah. always do, can they? They don't always know what a librarian or an archivist does when they're not face to face with them. And that gave us an opportunity to share a bit of extra information and for them to direct the session more. Can we see what's here? Can we see what's there? In rooms that maybe we don't always take them in. And it was, it was interesting for me because it let me see things that perhaps I didn't think they'd be interested in. Well, it was my wind-up radio because they'd never seen a wind-up radio before because I've got an old battery radio that I keep in the stacks for, you know, just entertaining myself and one of them caught sight of that or something else that they wanted to see so it really informed me and it was I think it was great fun both sides and I'd love to keep doing something like that they're used to GoPro they don't know archives when yeah. they first come yeah. but they know GoPro they use it as part of their teaching so there was a point of familiarity that was a great opener and they could direct the session and I really enjoyed doing it and I'd love to do more. That's wonderful. I, I think we librarians know and have experienced that wonderful serendipity of finding things in sex we wouldn't have found unless we walked down them, right? That's the one. That's entirely the one. And somebody else virtually on my shoulder going, can you take us here? Can you take us there? It was really, really enlightening. Can I ask you, how did you have the idea to do this in the first place? Oh, um, because the archive I'm in does not have a natural use on our, our campus because we don't have a research, a, a huge research presence. Or we didn't when I first joined. We didn't even have a history um, module, if you like. 
So it's been natural to look for other ways of sharing. And the fact that the outdoor learning students I know use GoPro, when the pandemic struck, it seemed like a good way to keep in touch because they they regularly film things and I ask for copies of things because students in the future might like to know how these things work. So it was it was just one of those moments where you think, what on earth have we got and what can we use? So that was where it came from, was just kind of sharing what your audience might have. And do you think that you would continue having this sort of um... Uh, join me, join me by GoPro in the stacks after we resume post pandemic operations, or is this something I don't, I'm not sure if your team has even thought about that yet, or, or do you see yourself continuing it, but with some, some modifications or changes? I think we'll, I'd love to continue um, and it will be user led. So if people, I, I can do can perhaps community talks, I mean, I'm thinking about things like care homes where people can't physically get in, but I can share content that perhaps they'd like to see or they'd just like the chance to, you know, have a little look around somewhere. And if I have some time to make some, some footage or it's lovely to have the live interaction. It's lovely to have people chatting to you while you're doing things. So if I can build that into my day, or into my week or into my month I'd love to keep that going that's fantastic I love that whole idea Gil thank you for for joining us at the table to share that I think I think I think that's such a very human interaction and I find it I find it very um hopeful that something like this came out of honestly something as as dark as as this pandemic was it's um, quite inspired and you've now inspired all of us are definitely using this one that's yeah. really lovely thank you Paul. thank you yeah, there's some the, for, for i think for susan um for myself the really the goal out of this interactive session was to learn from from you the attendees and there are so many wonderful ideas that have been shared in this padlet um, abigail i absolutely loved your idea of the virtual uh, viewings or previewings of archival materials, um, as well as we, someone else added that they've had remote internships. And so they had interns helping to transcribe um, some of their, their digital archives, uh, which I imagine helped significantly with discoverability, um, as well as the, uh, the process of having the digitization of, of rare books and rare, rare materials in their collections. Um, and I also saw someone else posted under uh, instruction services, uh, similar to having this um, uh, drop in off Zoom office hours. Someone also mentioned having virtual tea breaks for students or researchers to chat with curatorial staff about their research. Um, and this person adds that they represent a university museum and they had some virtual tea breaks for students or researchers to chat with curatorial staff about their research to help direct or encourage them. Um, this is something that uh, really I find very, very exciting. This, um, this way of reaching out to your users. Um, you know, I think a lot of our users, especially students who are uh, maybe graduate students or um, you know, working on their PhD levels, um, they might find themselves commuting to our campuses. They might not be living on campus. They might not always be able to just drop into the library um, whenever they so wish. And maybe using the library physically might require a little bit more planning. And so this idea of having a virtual space where your users can, can join you and they can meet you and they can speak with you, not necessarily in pursuit of, of um, research support like they might use with online chats or with emails, but really just in this, this, this social human interaction. I think, I, think that's, I think that's really quite lovely. Um, Love and the idea of virtual tea breaks. I, I'm looking for my tea sets now to take up on that idea. It's great. And I also wanted to mention on the remote internships, uh, that reminds me of all the citizen science projects um, that at least our Library of Congress and our National Archives here do in the, in the States. 
uh, and they say, we have these uh, pages that we need transcribed and we need um, pictures of leaves and bugs taken for our Natural History Museum. And they post these projects and anybody that wants to, you know, volunteer or contribute their time um, has a place and a project to work on. And I love this uh, idea here of these remote internships and taking that a bit further to um, sort of, the, we call them citizen science projects. And that is uh, contribute and add to the collections by letting others, um, uh, other than librarians and um, uh, curators uh, um, take on some projects. Sean, I see you mentioning that you were aware that a lot of researchers might be quite isolated during lockdown and not able to visit archives and libraries. Uh, do you see yourself, um, do you see your library, um, I, I'm, I'm presuming that you were one of the libraries that had the virtual teas or the Zoom um, uh, office hours. Is this something that you might continue offering through um, after the pandemic or have you not gotten to that point of thinking about um, the, the future times, the post pandemic world? I think we might do it if we have capacity. Uh, right now, I'm trying to think of ways to, to try to have this um, in my in my libraries, my regular practice. It's, it's a wonderful idea. Thank you for sharing that, Sean. And I see, uh, Christine, you mentioned uh, that you had actually two, the two digital interns, and that you would like to add more digital projects as it gives you more capacity. Yeah, I think it's wonderful. Um, please feel free to uh, raise your hand and join in if you want to speak more about it. But I think that's a that's a great way to increase uh, visibility and discoverability of of your uh, of your digital collections and a great way to give honestly the interns also some meaningful pre service experience while they're while they're still kind of getting their careers off of the ground so it really seems like a uh, feeding two birds from the same feeder very every everyone wins from this from this uh, arrangement. Um, uh, I, I just want to check how we're doing on time. Um, I'm not really able to. We have 11 on. minutes. We have 11 minutes to the yeah. top of the hour. Okay. Um, so I want to take a look and see if there's anything else here on the pilot that I might not have addressed. Outreach talks went online. Our entire outreach program went online with previous online talks going around the world. Um, we've continued this after lockdown. We also created a virtual tour of a new strong room block, as well as a panel session of staff members virtually talking about some of the dish different issues that we deal with at the archive. Um, that, that's very interesting. If you're the person who posted this, please feel free to raise your hand or um, type in the chat if you want to share more about that. I think that's really interesting. And I noticed that someone else mentioned um, that they had uh, recordings and live workshops. Uh, so we immediately began recording more tutorials and scheduled more live workshops. Um, which is actually something that that we did uh, that that sounds familiar to, to me as well. We did take advantage of a lot of um, screen recording tools, either Kaltura Capture or Loom. In my experience, I found that using a tool like Kaltura Capture or Zoom was the best because it could automatically generate captions. Whereas uh, Loom, as much as I loved it for its ease of recording uh, at this time, it can't automatically generate captions. So there is unfortunately an accessibility issue to that. Um, Jacqueline mentions that our entire outreach program was online as well, and we tried new formats or events and more interactive sessions. Uh, Jacqueline, was there a particular um, event that really worked well for you or for your library or that you were particularly proud of or enjoyed in, in particular? Um, Hi, yes. Um... Yeah, we had a few that were wildly popular. And, and the one that was my personal favorite. Um, we had a researcher who I started talking to and we did a knitting workshop um, on knitting patterns created from our, our, our 
manuscript collection. So looking specifically at illuminated initials from our manuscript materials. And this event, we had kind of a back and forth conversation style event along with a knitting workshop by the, by the woman who designed this pattern, Dr. Kristen Howard. And um, we had a presentation of our manuscript collection. So there was a highlight on that. And the thing that was impressive was just the reach to a community that we never really tapped into before. And knitting was a popular activity last year. I don't know, if out here it was. A lot of people turned to handicrafts as a way of filling your time or stress management. And this gave people a way of exploring and merging um, two different interests, so rare books and knitting. A lot, there's a lot of overlap if you do the, the Venn diagram. And that one we found was very well received. We wound up having to sort of improvise on the fly and wound up exceeding our Zoom limit and learning how to live stream to YouTube at the same time, which we subsequently did with a number of our other events. Um, so there was a bit of a learning curve over the uh, last year. I'm sure everyone can relate. We um, now have live streaming under our belt and we're looking forward to a hybrid model of events for the fall. We are things are opening up, but the virtual reach is large, and we found that it's it's let us engage like so many others here mentioned with different people around the world. Uh, case in point today, I'm in Montreal, <laughs> and you are clearly I'm not in England. And if this was an in-person conference, I don't know if I would have been able to go. Um, and that's the case with a lot of our events. We're finding people tuning in for that knitting event. It was all across the United States, Alaska, Canada. There were some people from overseas as well. Um, and we found a really engaging, a really good level of engagement with the chat. So we've had to reevaluate our measures of success or not necessarily success, but what constitutes engagement and what, um, what we, how we evaluate whether something is worth the effort that we put into it. So the long tail on these virtual events is, is nice because you put up the recording and people can continue to engage with it via our YouTube channels. And it's generated research interest in a new area. So that one in particular was fun because I'm also a knitter. So I was test knitting some of these patterns from our collections. Um, and that one was really something we'd never done before. So broke new ground and reached a community that our collections just hadn't been brought to before. And Jacqueline, I imagine it sounds like something you'll repeat, is that correct? I hope so, yes. Um, the, we, we, I have been talking to the same person actually about possibly doing an illusion knitting workshop because we have a new research project here looking at uh, cryptography and ciphers and coded communication. Um, and knitting was one of those means of transmitting coded messages. I don't know if any of you recall. Wow. A tailor. Yeah, that's really interesting. And so tell me the overlap again from uh, the designs found in illuminated manuscripts. Yeah, um, I can probably put a link to it. But when we were thinking of knitting from the collections, I suggested illuminated initials as a really in good way or something that would easily translate to a color work pattern. So we now have um, a pattern or actually an, I think almost the whole alphabet of illuminated initials and there's a cowl. The pattern is a knitted, knitted cowl. So if you need something warm and cozy, come uh, the damp winters in the UK, you can take oh. your needles and, and knit a cowl based on our collection. So, yeah. Well, now what you can do is we, we can take a, a page out of Gil's book and you can have a GoPro as you are as you're perusing your archives to find to find patterns and and talk through your models you come up with your patterns for for people to participate in that's that's wonderful and uh, uh christine has has commented uh, les, les, les what a wonderful tie-in between knitting and cryptography there are so many wonder i am so excited by all of these wonderful ideas it is almost 10 p.m here in in shanghai and i just I am inspired by some of the wonderful ideas that you have shared. Thank you all for these fantastic um, contributions and, and for taking the time and, and sharing what you have done, um, what's worked, some of these just very creative solutions. Um, uh, Susan, uh, mm -hmm. I, I've been talking a lot. I don't want to take away time from you to share. Do you have any thoughts on any of these ideas that we've seen so far or final reflections. I I was able to get my clock back and I see we're getting very close to the end of, uh, of our time. 
Right, I see we're at uh, three minutes to the top of the hour and when we'll end. So I would just think it would be time to wrap up and say what a great discussion. I really have appreciated uh, hearing what people's uh, experiences were because how else, uh, where else would we hear these kinds of things? I love this. You know, let's uh, find a practical stress relieving project in knitting um, by getting some inspirations and patterns from our collections. Wow, love that. I'm taking that one to my local public library too because the knitting group just started there. And um, there was so many, the virtual tea breaks, the yes, people needed to talk more. So the appointments became longer. So many things, so many more tools were tried and mastered. And if not mastered, we're on our way to mastery of these new tech tools. This is really exciting. The GoPro, let's walk the stacks as we usually do and let other people um, uh, tell us what they'd like us to find or notice things on the shelves. I love these ideas, the digitization, the having other people tell us what need to be digitized or uh, previewing that in advance with some uh, 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 virtual on camera demonstrations, all this just inspiring all of this. I'm so glad librarians are such a creative uh, group that then know how to communicate so that we can all learn. And we're all uh, teachers in um, many respects that we can share this and hope others take and expand on it. Um, and, and that's where I am with this. It's, it's really interesting. So